Welcome to today's video where we'll be unraveling the mystery of V1G and explaining how it can pay you money on top of any incentives you already receive from your energy company and how it might just be the cheapest way you could balance the national grid. So firstly, let's explain what V1G is. And we'll do this by explaining the terms that we often hear, which are V2G, V2H, and V2L. Now, V2 basically means that the vehicle power is going to a source, as in the number two, vehicle to a source. So that would be either G for grid, H for home, or L for load. So recently on the Ionic 5, I demonstrated that going to a plug socket, vehicle to load. Vehicle to grid would be you leaving power from your battery and putting it straight into the grid to power the grid. And vehicle to home would be vehicle power leaving your uh, electric vehicle battery and going to power your home. V these are all really expensive options because of A, they require a vehicle to grid capable car, which at the moment is only Chadamo, but CCS is coming, but there's no CCS powered vehicle to grid cars at the moment. And you'd also need a compatible vehicle to grid charger. Now, if you don't have either of these, it could be very expensive. And if you already have maybe one of these, it's still quite expensive to get one of these solutions to work. For V1G to work, however, you only need a charger that can handle V1G, which just has to be an AC charger. Now, this is a lot cheaper than a vehicle to grid charger because it doesn't have all the DC conversion systems that a vehicle to grid charger has. It also means that with a V1G charger, it's a cheaper price entry point to get one and it will work on any generation electric car, right down from a 22 kilowatt hour Renault Zoe all the way up to the latest Ford Mac E. V1G has been around for decades, but it's never been available to us mere mortals. That is until the new Indra Pioneer charger made it accessible to us mere mortals to access this available fund that was only available to large factories. And what used to happen, large factories were told by the National Grid to turn off or on power and were paid for doing exactly as the grid told them. Now in the past decades, this has only ever been available to those factories because of the economy of scale that they can turn on or off power to make grid response. But using this OCPP charger made by Indra and the, the pioneer team that they teamed up with EV.energy, it means that they can clump all their EV pioneer chargers together with EV Energy and they can access this available fund of money to do grid response, which means that they can turn control on and off of your charger to react to grid demand. And this means that together lumped in with loads of customers, they're able to access an amount of money and fund that they get paid so they benefit from this, but also they're able to share some of the money they make from this with you, the customer. This means that Indra, Pioneer and EV Energy have unlocked an unknown potential of money from your EV charger. Now they effectively will pay you one point for every 10 kilowatt hours of smart charging charging you do on this, which let's just put it this way. If you're with an energy company that may pay you for plunge pricing during certain events, and they're paying you 1p per kilowatt hour to consume electricity, and EV Energy have detected this is a grid response as well, you could actually be paid twice. You could be paid once by your energy company for that consumption of power, but also by EV Energy for turning on that charger anyway. So you're effectively doubling up on your EV savings and potential money you could make from charging your electric car. This means that you could be paying a low off peak rate for your electricity, but also being paid separately by Indra and EV Energy to consume power. But where does this money come from? Well, there's a couple of ways, and one of them is from your energy company, as Mike from Indra explains. Your energy company purchases energy in half an hour chunks in advance. What this means is that if they get over or under the amount of energy they've purchased for their customer base, they get fined. So what we're able to do through smart charging and V1G is a process called energy arbitrage. And this means we're trimming the amount of energy in or out of your car's battery at the end of each of these half an hours. That means start, starting or stopping charging just towards the end of that half an hour. 
And what that means is that the energy company doesn't receive those fines and then they can pass those savings on. That's just one of the revenue streams of V1G. There's also possibilities of actually getting additional money from your local network. Arbitrage is just one way we can extract revenue through V1G charging. One of the other methods is through your DNO. So this isn't tied to your energy company and we can basically uh, optimize smart charging to assist the DNO in their you know, the infrastructure they operate. So the DNO will take infrastructure from say a small town um, all the way through to the cables in your street and the, the, the main fuse in your house. Um, the issue is a lot of this infrastructure is really old and outdated so therefore to avoid costly infrastructure upgrades we can actually balance EV charging uh, across time and, and to avoid peak usage on that network and then also to, uh, to maybe do things like balancing across phases. And in some instances, there may even be a national call for V1G, which results in payments. DNO manages this at a local level, but then there's a national grid manager at a national level. So one of the ways this works is through frequency response. So we're able to monitor the grid frequency and the charges and then respond to that. So frequency goes up, uh, we know there's an oversupply, so we, we then want to charge cars and use that oversupply. If frequency goes down, we know that something's down well. Um, so therefore, we, we want to, to shed load and stop charging, and then there's the revenues for doing it. So the other method is through the balancing mechanism, which is a commercial framework set up for, for companies like ourselves to then trade via aggregators or virtual power plants um, and to pull up other um, standby reserves and, and services in order to respond to these events. So let's say, for example, a power station goes offline or a generator goes offline, like it did in London in 2019. Be able to very quickly shed load um, from from the grid in order to, to basically match supply with demand. Now, with small EV drivers, this deal has never been available to us because we're just too small. But pulled together in the way that Indra and EV Energy have done this means that we are even bigger than a typical factory. We have a bigger response and a more reliable response because. Indra know exactly how many cars are plugged in and how many cars are not plugged in and how many they can turn on or off in a given period of time. This kind of control means that the grid can really rely on this source of information and Indra can earn some money out of this as an extra revenue stream for them, but it means that they can also share this revenue stream with you and incentivize you. It means that the typical EV driver doing 12,000 miles a year can earn quite a decent amount of money. In fact, if you try and put down in the comments below what your mileage is, I'll try and get the Indra team to reply some to your comments what you could typically expect to receive in a year. Just remember, this is also on top of whatever your energy company is already offering you. So if you're already on a cheap off-peak tariff, you're just set offsetting that off-peak tariff by even more money. And sometimes energy companies in the past to customers who have got smart meters, they've actually said, if you turn off your power during this time, we'll give you a two pound credit. Or if you turn on uh, all your electricity appliances during this time, because we've seen high generation and low demand, we'll pay you this much. So even if you're on that kind of deal with your energy company and you're not on a special incentive, you can be paid effectively twice, once off your energy company and once through Indra. I think this is a really, really exciting technology. V1G brings the affordability of balancing the grid to everybody who can have an Indra Pioneer charger. They're not expensive chargers. They are pretty much the same price as every other person's charger. It means that it's effectively your charger can pay you a rent for sitting on your wall. Effectively, the more you're plugged in, the more potential money you could earn from your car even charging or even not charging. Now, one question I expect to come up on this is, what if you have solar? If you have solar, how will they deal with that? You're generating solar, you don't want to export it to the grid, you want to put it in your car, it's free energy that you've generated, you want that in your vehicle. Well, EV Energy and Indra have already thought of this. There's a little tick box in the Indra app that says that you've got microgeneration, and as long as you've got the Indra CT clamp on your, basically your supply of your house, it will see that you're not importing from the grid and you're generating electricity and use that to put it in the car. So they've already pre-thought of this and the big question is, what's next? And that is, can they use this solar generation that they're seeing to maybe increase possibilities of being paid double? So if they see generation 
and the grid is really short on energy and your battery is getting full or near to full or it's near the range that you already need, can they then, can you sign up to a, a deal of, of grid balancing and saying, right, I'd like to export this spare energy from my solar. So basically acting like a V to G system, but without V to G, just basically using your export. And can you be effectively paid to balance the grid that way? Well, it is a possibility and it's not something that Indra are doing right now, but it is in their pipeline to be looking at in the future. And depending on demand and how many customers they've got with microgeneration, they will look into doing some kind of V1G, V2G with your solar system in that kind of manner. Now I can see this being opened up in the future with V1 systems running battery storage and effectively you could be importing power at 5p a kilowatt hour and then later on exporting it and being paid. And there might even be the opportunity where not only are you buying it in at 5p, but EV Energy using V1G and Indra may be paying you to import it at the same time. So you're being paid and only paying 5p. And later on, there may be a grid response demand and they may pay you uh, through V1G to export it, but you'll also be paid for that export on, tw on twice. I mean, the limits of this technology are just absolutely mind-blowing because there is no limits of how far it could go. It's amazing for me to see the way the energy transition in the UK is completely changing the landscape and it's happening all over the world. V1G systems like this are happening all over the world and I do see that the UK V1G system may even get even smarter, especially with us all moving to heat pumps and smart connected appliances. How far would you go? Would you connect your dishwasher, your washing machine, or a heat pump, because that's probably the next best thing for V1G, maybe just to be turned off for five, 10 minutes during a given period, but you could be paid for that five, 10 minutes, and maybe even generating and turning on during you know times at night at 2 a.m. because there's high generation. Would you sign all your appliances up for this? Let me know down in the comments below. I think this is really exciting technology. Thank you very, very much for watching this week's video, and I'll see you again next week. Goodbye.